Howdy, Dietrich Labbers. It's time to talk about fermionic field quantization, meaning field quantization of a field whose field quanta end up being fermionic particles. Specifically, in this video, I'm going to show you how to quantize the free massive Dirac field. And it is both really similar and really different from the scalar boson cases. The basic process is essentially identical, but because we're starting with a Dirac Lagrangian instead of a scalar boson Lagrangian, the mathematics actually ends up looking quite different, and it's rather more intricate. In the end, though, it's a really fun and really satisfying quantum field theory problem that is a classic one you have to know, you have to study it, you have to learn it. It's great. So these complexities, these nuances that come about because you're dealing with a fundamentally more complicated theory end up being more than worth it just because of the sheer satisfaction that results from solving out a quantum field theory like this. So here follows the math section where I explain all the technical details associated with quantizing the free Dirac field. The Dirac Lagrangian density in natural units is this, where psi is a complex field and psi bar is given by this formula in terms of the Hermitian conjugate of psi. Psi and psi bar therefore must be treated as independent fields in the Lagrangian formalism. The equations of motion are given as follows. The canonical conjugate fields are given here. The conjugate to psi bar is zero, and the conjugate to psi is I psi dagger. We arrive at this value for the Hamiltonian density However, the Dirac equation allows us to rewrite it more simply. Specifically, with this relation derived from the Dirac equation, we can rewrite the Hamiltonian density like this, and the Hamiltonian like that. We also have this value for the momentum density, and therefore this value for the momentum. Then we realize that the Lagrangian has a global U1 invariance, and that there is a conserved Noether current associated with that invariance, which is this. Then we also notice then of course, there's an associated conserved charge, which takes on this value. This charge can be associated with electric charge without inconsistency. Its operator will be used to tell the charge of the various quantum states. Now, you may remember from one of my previous videos where I calculated the plane wave solutions to the Dirac equation. They take on this form where the S denotes the spin. We can have spin up or spin down and they correspond to these choices ultimately of these us vectors and vs vectors without the momentum argument. Then of course we have this standard relation and here we will be selecting the Dirac representation of the gamma matrices. One can construct the most general solution to the Dirac equation by taking an arbitrary linear combination of these plane wave solutions. So using standard normalization we have this result here can take the Hermitian conjugate of it and multiply it by gamma zero from the right and we arrive at this result here. Also in the video where I solved the Dirac equation for plane waves, I showed these relations and we need them to invert these relations to find expressions for the Fourier coefficients in terms of the fields. Additionally, in various computations, these two identities will be useful. Their proofs are very similar, so I've only written down the proof for this one. The first step is to rewrite this, taking advantage of the fact that gamma zero squares to the identity. Then we can use the equations that we know these two objects satisfy in order to solve for new expressions for them. Specifically rearranging these two equations, we arrive at these two results. We can then take this quantity to be a half the sum of two copies of this re-expression of it, and then we can substitute these values in, where we substitute one of them in one term and the other in the other term. We can then recognize in this an anti-commutator showing up. Then we realize that the anti-commutator of the gamma matrices is twice the metric tensor. Plugging that in ultimately gives us this result. So we have proved this identity, and the proof of this one is almost identical. Let's start inverting. If we begin with the field psi here and compute this integral, we get a step closer. The x integration here can be performed with these two integral formulas. Applying them gives this result. These delta functions can now be used to perform the p integration. 
doing the p-integration gives us this result. Since we've performed the p-integration, we can now eliminate the prime label. Next, we can reverse the sign of the momentum p to arrive at this relation. Then after this, we can multiply by u bar r of p on both sides of the equation. Then we can use this relation from above to arrive at the fact that this term vanishes. That yields this result. Then we can recognize these formulas in order to rewrite both sides of the equation. Then we can apply this formula, also given above and derived above, to re-express this side of the equation like this. Then if we reverse the sign of the momentum again, we arrive at the desired relation. Now we can take the Hermitian conjugate of this relation to obtain the result for the Hermitian conjugate of this operator, which is the second result we were looking for. Now we can perform a similar process for B of R. Working through it, we find that we can integrate this one, doing the X integration with the same formulas, and then the P integration with the resulting delta function, to ultimately arrive at this. Then we can ignore the primes, reverse the sign of the momentum, and then multiply by Vs of P. After we do this on both sides, we can remember this relation and realize that that term vanishes, which gives us this result. Then we can make use of these two identities to rewrite both sides of the equations in order to find this relation. Then we can rewrite this side using this value for this product of three objects. That ultimately gives us this value for this integral. We can then reverse the sign of the momentum again to arrive at the third inverted formula. We can then take the Hermitian conjugate of that one to arrive at the final one. Here are all four of the inverted formulas that we just found. Quantization with equal time commutation relations gives unphysical answers. To get results that make sense, one must quantize with equal time anti-commutation relations. This turns out to be necessary any time a half integer spin field is being quantized. It has the effect of causing the field quanta to obey Fermi-Dirac statistics, and therefore be fermions, as we shall see. Additionally, quantizing integer spin fields with equal time anti-commutation relations gives similar unphysical results. This effect is called the spin statistics theorem. Replacing commutators with anti-commutators gives the following equal time anti-commutation relations for the various fields we're dealing with. Because we've inverted the relationships between the fields and the Fourier coefficients to yield relationships for the Fourier coefficients in terms of the fields, and we have this set of anti-commutation relations for the fields, we can now easily calculate the anti-commutation relations of the Fourier coefficients. If we directly plug in the fields, we arrive at this value, and then we can recognize that the zero gamma matrix squares to the identity, manipulating and unsuppressing the spinner indices to avoid confusion, which would otherwise almost necessarily result, we arrive at this relation. Then we can do some factoring and simplify it down a little bit, and then recognize that what we're dealing with is an anti-commutator. Then we can apply the equal time anti-commutation relations to arrive at this value. We're then free to bring this through, and this delta ij, because the indices are contracted, ultimately just changes the j index here into an i. Now if we suppress the spinner indices, we arrive at this value. We can then do the x prime integral quite easily because of this delta function, which ultimately gives us this result. Now finally, we can do the x integration using this integration formula here. Applying this ultimately simplifies this down to this result here. And then finally, we can apply this relation from above in order to arrive at this final answer for the value of the anti-commutator of these two Fourier coefficients. Now we can do a similar calculation. It proceeds basically exactly the same in order to do the commutator of b with b dagger. The result ultimately is this. I tried to scroll slowly so that if you want to see the calculation, you can pause. But just to make sure, I'm going to scroll up again slowly so that you have a chance to pause at every single part if you want to check your work in detail. All other Fourier coefficient anti-commutators trivially evaluate to zero given these two anti-commutation relations. So the complete set of Fourier coefficient anti-commutation relations 
ends up being this set of eight of them. With these anti-commutation relations established, the states of the theory can be worked out. The first step is to express the Hamiltonian in terms of the Fourier coefficients. The process of doing this starts with the expression of the Hamiltonian given above, this expression here. We can now insert the values of the fields. Doing that gives this result. Then if we multiply that out, we arrive here. And then we can do these integrations over x using these two formulas. Doing that gets us here. These delta functions then allow us to do the p prime integration. Then we can make use of these identities to rewrite this term and this term usefully. Specifically, it gets it into a form where we can use these identities to reveal that in fact they just vanish. Then we can get rid of these products using these identities, which gets us here. And we can do the sum over r because of these Kronecker deltas. And we can bring this through and it'll cancel against that. So that ultimately gets us here. Then we can rewrite this in terms of this reordered term and the anti-commutator. Then we can re-express that anti-commutator using the value we found for it above, which gives us this answer. Infinite and finite shifts in the zero point of the energy scale cannot be measured, so the last term can be ignored. Doing this gives the normal ordered Hamiltonian. In the case of spin-half fields, normal ordering is formally defined as at the cost of a minus sign every time operators move past each other, positioning all A daggers and B daggers to the left and A's and B's to the right, where we'll find later that the A daggers and B daggers are creation operators and the A's and B's are annihilation operators. Doing this yields more sensible quantum physical expressions. The big difference between normal ordering bosonic operators and fermionic operators is the minus sign that shows up under interchange fermionic operators. While we're at it, it is worth expressing the momentum and charge introduced above in terms of the Fourier coefficients. Let's start with the momentum. Above, we found that the momentum is equal to this value. We can now insert the values of the fields. Doing that gets us here. We can then multiply it out. And very similar to above, we can use these integral relations to do the x integration. Doing that brings us here. Then we can use all these delta functions to do the p prime integration. Afterwards, we can make use of these identities to usefully rewrite this term and this term, which ultimately gets it in a form that through these formulas makes it apparent that those two terms vanish, getting us here. We can then use these formulas to eliminate these annoying factors there, which gets us here. We can again do the sum over r, and that ultimately relabels an index here and here as s, then normal ordering gets us to the final answer. We now see that normal ordering uniquely bypasses the divergence to return the empirically correct result. So we take the normal ordered momentum as the final result. Now that the momentum is done, let's express the charge introduced at the beginning in terms of Fourier coefficients. We realize that the values of these fields are this, so plugging those in arrives us here. Again, we multiply out, do the x integration with these same integral relations. That gets us here. Then we can do the p prime integration, rewrite with formulas like these, and then apply these formulas to vanish those two terms there, which simplifies down to this. And we can simplify those further using this formula. We can then do the r sum, which gets us here. Then we can re-express this in terms of the anti-commutator and this reordered term. We can substitute the value of the anti-commutator in to give this. We see now that normal ordering uniquely bypasses the divergence and returns the empirically correct result. So we take the normal ordered charge as the final result. Now let's find the meaning of the various Fourier coefficient operators by exploring their effect on the energy. We can postulate an energy eigenstate, even though we have not yet figured out how to actually write down an explicit energy eigenstate, we can still postulate the existence of one and use it to study the properties of these Fourier coefficient operators. So if we plug in the value of the Hamiltonian and bring this to the other side through use of the anti-commutation relations, and then simplify in this excruciatingly detailed description, we arrive at this result and an essentially identical calculation 
gives this result for the B S of P operators. Therefore we see that A of P and B of P are lowering or annihilation operators as mentioned above. They remove a quantum of energy from the state they act on. Then we can investigate the A daggers and B daggers. Again we can apply the Hamiltonian to these operators applied to an energy eigenstate. Can plug in the value of the Hamiltonian and attempt to bring this across using the anti-commutation relations and then simplify, ultimately giving us this result. And then a virtually identical calculation gives this result for B dagger. We therefore see that A dagger and B dagger are raising or creation operators, as mentioned above. They add a quantum of energy to the state they act on. From here, a few important realizations can be made. First, because the Hamiltonian is an integral over these two products, its expectation values are necessarily non-negative, of course. With this in mind, because A of P and B of P lower the value of the eigenvalue by one quantum, there must be a lowest state that gets zeroed by A of P and B of P. So we have these relations. This ground state will be taken as the definition of the vacuum. Because it has no quanta of energy left to be annihilated, one can then interpret these energy quanta to be particles, in this case spin half massive particles of two different types because we are quantizing a massive complex Dirac spinner field theory. With this interpretation, one can see that field quantization has had the following effect. At a given frequency, only discrete energy levels are allowed, and they correspond to particles, field quanta of either type being present at that particular frequency, of course, respecting the limits of Pauli's exclusion principle. So no two particles can exist in exactly the same quantum state. So if you want, say, two electrons to have the same momentum, then they must have opposite spin. Basically, the states of the theory simply correspond to a vacuum containing some number of massive spin half particles with various frequencies. Basically, the states of the theory simply correspond to a vacuum containing some number of massive spin half particles of various frequencies. One can act on the vacuum state with the creation operator to populate it with particles. A one particle state can be written like this, and an arbitrary multiparticle state can be written in this manner. Because the creation operators anti-commute with each other, these field quanta obey Fermi-Dirac statistics and are fermions. They obey the Pauli exclusion principle, as was previously mentioned. The zero point on the energy scale is set such that the energy of the vacuum has a value zero. As a consequence, we have these relations. We can then apply the formula for the momentum operator that we calculated above on these states and we find that the eigenvalue we get just corresponds to the momentum. Now for the key result from the charge calculation. If we apply the charge operator to the two different types of particle states, then we arrive at this result. This cements our interpretation of these two different types of particles as particles and antiparticles because they have that opposite charge. Okay, so now you've seen all the technical details associated with quantizing the massive free Dirac field. You've seen how the field quanta end up satisfying Pauli's exclusion principle and obeying Fermi-Dirac statistics. You've seen the whole anti-commutator instead of commutators in the equal time commutation relations. You've seen how that ultimately is what causes the particles, the field quanta, to satisfy Fermi-Dirac statistics. You've seen this fundamental new character, and you've also seen how the complexities of the Dirac equation do actually make the mathematics quite a bit more intricate, but still fundamentally the same process. I hope this helped you understand this piece of quantum field theory better. I hope it helps you develop a stronger love for the subject of quantum field theory. If it was useful to you, please give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe. Dietrich out.